and welcome to Talking Dance, Improving Racial Equity. My name is Ginny Brown and I'm the Chief Executive of the ISTD. During today's presentation, each speaker will start with a self-description to support any attendees with visual impairment and will then aim to reintroduce themselves each time they speak. So, I am a woman in my mid fifties. I have thick, curly, brown, shoulder length hair, pale skin, and I'm wearing glasses. It's a real pleasure to welcome you all to this morning's event, which we're hosting in partnership with the Tired Movement, and that stands for Trying to Improve Racial Equality in Dance, and some of the country's leading dance teaching organisations, BBO Dance, the International Dance Teachers Association, and the Royal Academy of Dance. The events of 2020 have increased public awareness of racial inequities, and have naturally prompted many arts and education organisations to reconsider their approach to equality and diversity. All of today's partner organisations have taken time to reflect and listen and to begin the process of consulting with dancers, teachers and staff who have experienced racial discrimination to better understand the barriers to accessing our dance classes. These conversations have highlighted systemic barriers that need to be addressed in order for people of all ethnicities to feel welcome in the independent dance school sector. So today's symposium is an opportunity to discuss roadblocks to diversity in dance education and training and how these can be dismantled to create an inclusive and diverse future for dance. We are really delighted to be joined by over 500 delegates today, which clearly demonstrates the interest in this important topic and the desire to make, be part of making change happen. We would like this event to be as interactive as possible, so you're invited to post questions in the Q&A box throughout the morning. And we will also be recording the keynote presentations, that's up to the break, but all questions will be anonymized. I'm, I'm now pleased to introduce Kenneth Tharp, who will be facilitating this morning's conversation. I believe Kenneth is ideally placed to be leading these conversations as he has seen the profession from all angles. He began learning ballet as a child in a local dance school, went on to become principal dancer of London Contemporary Dance Theatre. He has taught and choreographed for many years, held a number of senior leadership positions, including at The Place and the Africa Centre and is currently Interim Chief Executive at Eclipse Theatre. So welcome, Kenneth. Ginny, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. Uh, as Ginny said, my name is Kenneth Tharp. Um, for those that would benefit from an audio description, I am a brown-skinned man of English and Nigerian descent with dark brown eyes and glasses. I have a moustache and a goatee beard um, and a generous, I haven't had a shape up in nine months afro, all with plenty of gray. Uh, I'm wearing a white shirt and a dark blue waistcoat. Uh, in a short while, I'll be introducing you to the first of our brilliant keynote speakers. But first I'd like to begin by thanking the ISTD uh, for initiating the idea for this symposium and to Ginny Brown for inviting me to take part. I also um, want to thank the colleagues at partner organizations, BBO, IDTA and the RAD for coming together to support this event. Uh, and I also want to thank and to welcome Stacey Green from the Tired Movement who will be with me throughout the day, offering thoughts and insights from her work in the sector. Uh, the Tired Movement founded by Stacey aims to remove the fear of discussing racism amongst peers and colleagues and to help ensure best practice within the dance industry. Welcome Stacey. Uh, but my, most importantly, I also want to extend a very warm welcome to the, the, the hundreds of you who are with us online. We can't see you, but I like to think that we can feel your presence through the ether. Uh, many of you I know are dance teachers, and therefore I don't need to explain to you the transformative power of dance or the important role teachers play in setting the tone for how people begin their journey in dance, whether it's for recreation and pleasure or in seeking a professional career. I was lucky enough to start dancing at the age of five, studying classical ballet whilst living in Glasgow. 
I was the only boy. One of my first starring roles at a tender age was in the title role of Little Black Sambo. Now, while some of you gasp in horror, others of you may recognize that as the title of a famous children's novel written and illustrated by the Scottish author Helen Bannerman and published in October 1899. The boy, a Tamil child, was actually a hero who saved his village from marauding tigers through bartering his clothes and through his ingenuity and wit. But the book fell out of popularity as words like Sambo became more common in usage as racial slurs. I say that, share that with you, not to shock in any way or to attack the memory of my first ballet teacher who I kept in close contact with for many years, but to demonstrate how things have changed in my lifetime. Words and language that once would not have raised an eyebrow uh, are now no longer appropriate. And language, I think, is one of the reasons we're here. But the other big reason we're here is because of what happened on the streets of Minneapolis on the 29th of May, 2020, the murder of George Floyd. It was a scenario that was not new to black America or to anyone looking closely from the outside. It was something that he had witnessed, had been witnessed time and time again. As the brilliant commentator, John Amechi pointed out, it's exhausting to watch someone be murdered for looking like you. And again and again to see it on social media. The killing sparked a moral outrage across the world, forcing us all to finally wake up to the fact that whatever our personal belief, that all lives matter, it was painfully, a painfully clear reminder that not all lives matter equally to everyone. Protests took place across the world demanding that black lives needed to matter, that people of color be treated with the same dignity, respect and value as their white counterparts. The issue was thrown into the spotlight, center stage, and I think with the hindsight of the year, we can see how the combination of a global pandemic and a social just move, justice movement forced us all to confront issues that society was not as equal as we might want it to be. There was no show to put on <laughs> uh, for that night or for many nights, and therefore there was no relegating the matter of racial equity to the we'll get to this when we can pile of things to do. The issues and challenges raised are not peculiar to dance or to any one organization. They're a reflection of what is happening across society. But I think in terms of today, it's enormously healthy to see uh, such an important part of the dance sector coming together to listen, to learn, and to talk about how we ensure that our industry works towards greater racial equity and ensures that dance, no matter where it is practiced, offers a safe and welcoming space for all. One of the key opportunities, I think, in our symposium is to hear from a broad range of voices and experiences. And this gives us a chance for us all to listen, to learn, to see, and to understand beyond our own lived experience. And I have encouraged our keynote speakers and later our panelists to feel that they can speak openly, honestly, and authentically from their own lived experience. Just as I encourage all delegates attending to do the same in the way that you engage comment or ask questions. And I think our job today, whether as speakers or attendees, is not necessary to have answers for all the questions that may arise, but to use this as an opportunity to see the world through the eyes and ears of others, to understand perhaps that the journey in dance may be different for some, and to better understand the barriers and challenges they may have faced, no matter how successful they have become. So a couple of things about the how of today. Um, I believe the best thing that we can do today is listen well. And I think the next best thing we can do is not so much let go of our fear or fears, but actually acknowledge them. You know, the last year has seen us all living through fear of some kind, of many kinds. Fears of getting sick with coronavirus, fears of dying, of losing loved ones, fear of loneliness, fear of losing your job, your livelihood, your business. I've also sensed another kind of fear uh, indeed witnessed another kind of fear around the sensitive topic of race and identity, a fear that we're still living with, fear of doing or saying the wrong thing, of causing offence unintentionally, of being called out, and with that big unanswered questions of what do we do next or I just don't know what I should say. We know as dance teachers that fear can be debilitating. Um, and we can be mindful of what can happen when we're fearful. Being fearful can make us nervous, defensive, even angry. It's a form of defense. So, which is why I think one of the most important messages I want to say as we begin today is that we're all committed to creating a safe space and a listening space. 
I think it's really important that we're able to talk about challenging or uncomfortable things and to feel that but to feel that we're doing so in a safe space where no one will get verbally attacked or taken to task if they say something that anyone else disagrees with or feels uncomfortable about. In other words, I think it's really important that to have for us to have a that we're able to have a robust discussion where we can respectfully disagree that we're not afraid to enter into challenging waters, but that we do so safely. No one should feel that they're going to drown, however choppy the waters may get. Uh, I see that not only as my responsibility as facilitator, uh, but I also see it as a shared responsibility where each of us play a role in creating that space, which is why I mentioned this now at the start of the day. And while the, the, the focus of the day is serious, a bit of laughter or lightheartedness never goes amiss. So let us also not be afraid to let our time together be varied and colorful. Um, so lastly, before I introduce our first speaker, a few brief house rules um, from me, listen well, be generous, be courageous. Um, as Ginny's already said, we want this event to be interactive. So please do feel free to put questions in the Q&A box and please name who you're addressing the question to. And we will try uh, 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 along with the speakers to respond to as many points as possible. Um, if you'd like to comment, please feel free to put your comments in the chat box and I can see that's already being used and I'll have a look in a moment. Um, and and uh, so yes, questions in the question box, chat in the chat box. Um, all the resources that are mentioned throughout the day, um, and I will be asking speakers to highlight things that they found useful, articles, uh, reading material, organisations, um, they will be circulated by email afterwards and some may be put in the chat as we go. And lastly, for those of you on social media who may want to post, um, we encourage you to use the hashtag Talking Dance with a capital T and D. Now, I'm going to welcome our first keynote speaker, um, Karina H. Maynard. Karina is an educator, a curator, and a broadcaster who specializes in representation in the arts and culture sectors. She's a board member and executive director for representation and social impact at the Erdang Academy. Karina produces cultural programs and content that highlight black artistic legacies, contextualize the role of the arts in transformative cultural movements and decolonize cultural knowledges. She's a broadcaster and indeed I met her three years ago um, as she invited me to appear on her regular culture show on Colourful Radio. Karina, a very warm welcome to you. Over to you for our first keynote. Good morning. Thank you so much, Kenneth. Um, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you to the Tired Movement, the ISTD, BBO Dance, the IDTA, RAD, and once again, our facilitator, Kenneth Tharp, for providing us with this incredible opportunity to share ideas and consider new approaches to advance our collective aim in improving racial equity in dance. My name is Karina H. Maynard. Um, for anyone who will benefit um, from a visual description, I'm a black British woman of Guyanese and Bajan heritage. I have brown skin, braided hair. I'm wearing a black top with silver polka dots and my pronouns are she and her. As Kenneth said, I'm a board member and executive director at the Erdang Academy. I'm also a cultural curator, producer, facilitator, and consultant. And I've always been a multi-hyphenate. That's not a new thing for me. When I started my career 20 years ago, I worked in the media and communications. I was a journalist back in 2002, continuing my passion for music and dance as an entertainment and cultural reporter. And then I had a very interesting day job. I worked in communications and my very first role was at New Scotland Yard as project manager for the implementation of recommendation 61 of the Stephen Lawrence Inquiry Report. My role was challenging, especially for a young person just starting out in her career. And recommendation 61 was the recommendation that police stops are monitored because they provide the biggest indication of racial inequities in policing. So as you can imagine, as a young person in internal communications, trying to facilitate organizational change through marketing and 
equalities training and so forth, it at times could be overwhelming, but it taught me a lot. But I must say that Fast forward 20 years later, the events of over the last year and the climate has taught me more about my practice than ever. What I've learned in my role at the Erdang, um, which has been an absolute blessing, um, Solange Erdang is at the helm and her family has a history of um, supporting and nurturing diversity. And that's why they have such an incredible legacy for diversity at the Erdang. And last year, I really had the opportunity to do whatever was required to support students and staff and other stakeholders as we went through an incredibly challenging year. Beyond my, year, my work at the Erdang, I consult educational institutions, the entertainment industries, and for, for a lot of people, what was going on was incredibly frightening. We had organizations being called out on social media and we had a lot of people rushing to defend themselves um, because as individuals, we all feel as though we have good intentions. Um, and to be honest, I don't think that there was an easy way for anyone to manage the events and the climate of the past year. But what I've learned over the last year is that changes to racial equity, understanding and progress doesn't start with our policies and our practices. I believe that these changes start with self-development. And I would like to share with you today four aspects that I think can really help with our approach to making changes that last. The first aspect that in my workshops with young performers, I've actually facilitated workshops with over 500 young dancers over the last year alone. One of the major themes that is really important in understanding race and helping people get clear about how they feel about race and racism is identity, who we are, what do we believe and what do we stand for? Quite often in society, conversations around race start when we have a problem to solve. Indeed, we're here today to address issues of inequity in dance. But in order for us to effectively approach these issues, then our conversation, conversations about race need to be a lot broader and start a lot earlier. Decolonization is a word that is used quite a bit at the moment and for many people it has very different meanings. It can be very uncomfortable I think particularly for us here in Britain because our history is so complex, the way history has been written, the way history has been taught and even our national pride is very much wrapped up in a colonial past. However it's incredibly important that we we think about colonialism and its lasting impact. Throughout or beyond 400 years, we lived in a world or there was a world where European nations had colonized the majority of the world, including Africa, the Middle East, North and South America and Australia. Today, we're a diverse society. People have moved around um, cultures have been blended. However, many of the legacies of colonialism still exist because they were so deeply embedded in our societal structures, our religion and belief systems, our literature, even our arts and our dance. So therefore, when people have conversations around decolonization, it's very complex. For some people, it's quite simple. We must change things. We must change history, how it's, how it's taught, how it's conveyed. For other people though, this feels like a direct attack on their national identity in particular, on their Britishness. So I think it's very important that as artists, we consider our identities in, in the entire scope of who we are, and we are uniquely positioned to do that. 
We are uniquely positioned and we have the privilege to tapping into who we are, tapping into our creativity and our expression, going from vision to realization and taking audiences along with us. So I think if anybody can be creative and think about how we can progress the conversation, particularly when it comes to our history and how it's contextualized, artists are uniquely designed to do that. The second aspect that I think is really important is self-reflection. There's been a lot of calling out in the past year, um, and I think it's incredibly important that we self-reflect. Self-reflect gives us the ability to find compassion for ourselves as we go through this journey, as we're learning, as we're growing, and also it enables us to have compassion for other people as they are trying to do the same thing. One of the biggest challenges that I've encountered over the last year is when institutions have been quite defensive because the calling out isn't pleasant, it isn't comfortable for anybody. However, when we self-reflect, as I said before, it changes how we treat ourselves and how we treat other people and only when our defenses are down can we honestly look at ourselves and see where there's room for improvement because we've just spoken about colonization and we talk about race but this isn't just about black and brown people this is a worldwide thing everybody is part of this world we've all been categorized according to our race and we've all grown up with the same belief systems embedded within society. So we all have work to do. For some people that work um, feels more in terms of changing society, but for other people, a lot of that work is internal because as well as racism causing oppression, also black and brown people in particular often struggle with their own self-identity because of how they've been represented and the disparities in um, how they're treated compared to their non-black and brown counterparts. The, th the third aspect, which I think is particularly significant for us as educators, is learning. Quite often we reach certain positions or we're in a position, the position to be an educator because we've mastered something. We're, you know, we've, we've learnt almost everything they, that we need to know in order to, to then impart knowledge. And what I've found over the last year is a lot of educators and leaders in particular have struggled with being the person in the room that doesn't have all the answers, particularly as a lot of the activism over the last year has come from our young people. So it's incredibly important that we practice what we preach that we embody a mindset of lifelong learning. If we don't, I'm afraid, I don't think this, the younger generation will, will put up with it and they'll take the reins. But I think that would be a, be a shame because with all of the knowledge and experience that we have, if we can do the self-development, learn and grow, then that can only enrich the conversation. The final aspect I like to think of as transformation. When we learn more and more about the contextual history and what has brought us to this point, when we've looked at who we are and we're constantly learning more about ourselves and exploring more of our identities. And as we, if we have the right approach to continual learning, then a lot of the work that we have to do becomes a lot easier. It becomes a lot easier because the vision for racial equity comes from us. It's not imposed on us through the policies and practices, even though that's how we collectively make change. It comes from within us. And when we have a sense of ownership of the work that we're doing and why we're doing the work, that can be an incredibly powerful. So I'm sure there'll be many conversations here today about what race equity looks like in the dance studio, in the classroom and in the boardroom. But as Kenneth said at the outset, I think it's incredibly important that we listen and that we accept the fact that by pushing things forward, 
we're not taking away anything. We're adding to. By removing barriers, we are adding to the culture within dance. By looking at decolonization, we're not erasing history. We're including the narratives and the people that were omitted or misrepresented in history. So thank you for listening to me. I am really looking forward to today's conversations. Um, please do get in touch. I have an incredible network of anti-racist educators and people who work in incredible genres and subgenres in dance, both classical and mainstream. Um, as I mentioned, I also facilitate CPD training and youth workshops. And I, with my colleague, Kamara Gray, I facilitate training for dance educators about removing barriers with a focus on the African diaspora. So I'll be happy to speak with anybody who ever wants to talk about any of these issues or needs signposting or indeed wants direct help from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Karina. And as you were introducing yourself, I, I realized that the, the, the word to describe myself that I'd been searching for my for the whole of my freelance career was to be a multi-hyphenate. Um, <laughs> thank you. Look, some powerful messages there, some really clear messages about identity, uh, the opportunity and the need for self-reflection, for learning, for transformation. Um, one quick and, 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 the, and the notion of being compassionate, not only with others, but also for us with ourselves as we go through this. And one thing that, that a thought that came to mind as you were talking is the fact that look, as teachers, um, we're always on, you know, we re we're always in the spotlight. You know, we're always so that those moments that we can take away, you know, um, to reflect on things are, are sometimes quite hard to find. Um, but, but really important. Uh, and, the, and before I get Stacey to introduce herself um, and audio describe herself, I just wanted to pick up on one word, uh, uh, which is decolonization um, often seems to suggest um, to many people, I think, the notion that you want to take something away, like the notion of decluttering. It's the way, you know, the, the, and, and sometimes the, perhaps that's not the most helpful thing. We suggest we want to get rid and erase. Whereas I think most of the conversations I have with people like yourselves who, who, who are experts in this field say that actually it's about amplifying history. It's about adding bits that have not been represented. You know, how, how can we have a film like Dunkirk that was made in 2017 about the Second World War in which you know, almost all people of color were erased. You know? And we know that one of the last regiment on that beach in Dunkirk were an Indian regiment brought in with their donkeys and mules to help with shift the heavy artillery. Um, so again, it, it is, if, it's, if it's about rewriting history, it's not to um, erase anything, but it's probably to, to make it more inclusive and more representative of what happened, that the lives of black and brown people, whether in the UK or elsewhere, um, are made visible. Um, Stacey, would you like to, uh, I'm going to invite you if you have any comments that you would might to, like to make in response to uh, Karina's uh, keynote and also maybe just audio describe yourself on the way in. Okay, good morning everybody. Um, as Kenneth said, I'm Stacey. I'm the co-founder of the Thai of Movement and I'm also the principal of Freedom Dance and Performance. Thank you, Karina. I thought that was a fantastic talk this morning and really inspiring um, and a great start to this conversation. Um, I think uh, when we look at what Karina said with regards to self-reflection, I think that is the start of everything. You know, how can we start to begin these conversations around what it means to be fully inclusive and, um, and raise awareness about racial equality and talk about the uncomfortable things and get comfortable with the uncomfortable? We have to start with ourselves, And I think that's a really important part because, you know, none of us like um, people to see, think badly of us, you know, and think that um, if there's anything negative said with regards to language or phrasing or our teaching practices, that it's a negative reflection on the self. Um, and I think if we start to look internally, then um, at the very beginning, I think that is the start of what will be um, a great journey um, for us all to start to look at our organisation as being inclusive, particularly as educators. Thank you, Stacey. Um, um, but just before I come to Karina again, I just want to remind uh, uh, attendees, please feel free to put questions in the chat. 
Um, some people may choose to uh, write answer to them, and, but we'll have a moment um, uh, in a little while to try and get to some of them. There's one, there's already a, a chat there about the discomfort of, of how dance wear is labeled um, in certain <laughs> unhelpful things like tan and sun, extra suntanned, etc. cetera. Um, Karina, I just, with your work at Erdang, um, with the students, how has the last year impacted on them? And what, could you tell us a little bit more about the journey that you've been on with your students? Absolutely. Um, our students were incredibly vocal during the Black Lives um, Matter movement. Um, and I spoke with Solange and I said, I really feel as though identity and self-reflective work will be valuable for our students as well as our um, teachers and professionals and she sort of gave me the green light and go ahead to do whatever was needed. It's been incredibly um, interesting and of course there's a variety of um, conversations that come up but I think um, so the workshops that I do start with identity, race and culture conversations um, and then we sort of move through to even contemporary dance or forum theatre where the young people themselves produce their own creative work. And that's where we really get to see their understanding of the themes, but also of solutions. So um, the range of conversations that come up for a lot of our young people, particularly as um, it's the kind of um, conservatoire where young people come from all over the UK to study there. So a lot of them haven't necessarily grown up in diverse environments. And one of them, first comments I always get is that they feel almost lied to or robbed of education because they have learned so little about the global experience um, in history um, at school. So that's the first thing they say. And they say that puts them on the back foot because they, you know, they have feelings, they want to express themselves, but they feel like they don't have the language and the knowledge to take part in conversations. Um, and so they've said they find the workshops incredibly useful that they can sort of speak about things they've never spoken about before, um, but also develop their understanding and their language. And they always ask for additional resources. Um, they ask for resources, whether they start inquiring, every single workshop is different because every group of young people is different. So sometimes they might ask for more information about apartheid South Africa, sometimes they might speak more about Australia and the history there, um, so it's always different. I think for, um, in particular, um, white British boys, the conversation around identity um, is particularly poignant for them because quite often they're not asked to um, define who they are, they just are in this society, in this context. So I think it's incredibly important for them to be given the opportunity to consider who they are. Um, because as we've as said in my um, opening talk, when we're talking about decolonization and there's all this criticism about these things that are um, considered to be British, a source of British pride, then if their only identity is that I'm white and British and somebody else owns that narrative of what it means to be white and British, when that is attacked and they don't sort of consider any other aspect of themselves, it can be particularly damaging. But I think, you know, whether we're talking about race or anything else, it's important that they're sort of in, given the opportunity and the environment to explore more of themselves, especially as creatives. I think we should be asking our young artists and performers to do more identity work, um, because not only does it help um, foster cultural understanding, but it also helps with their self-esteem and confidence, particularly as they're sort of in very competitive environments and going into industries where they'll face rejection, or they'll face challenges that they need to navigate. Um, especially as you know we prepare students not just for sort of classical settings but also for the entertainment music and film industry and we know some of the challenges that we've heard over the last year so i think that's been prevalent um but every single workshop is different but it's incredible to see how quickly young people grasp um, um concepts and develop their own narratives and it's 
and it's always positive. Thanks so much, Karina. Listen, I'm, I'm keeping a close eye on the time. Um, one of the questions that I might save for later when, when we all come back together as keynote speakers is to ask you, uh, A, are there any particular resources and things that you'd recommend, but also um, teaching a conservatoire is, is different perhaps when you, you know, when you see students in, in, with that kind of, um, the amount of contact time you have allows you to do certain things. A lot more challenging, maybe if you're running a local dance school and you see students, you know, for an hour at a time. So maybe a one to one challenging question might be: How would you suggest someone, someone in that context, begin to approach the, some of the things you describe? Um, allow me, please, just to bring my notes up. Um, there's some great comments in the chat, Karina. People thanking you for a brilliant start, um, and thank you for mentioning the idea about connecting and caring for ourselves before before entering to the world of policy. Um, thank you so much, Karina. Um, I, I'm going to introduce our next keynote speaker. Um, and I'm going to preface that by saying in October last year, I interviewed, was invited to interview six dancers of colour in the Royal Ballet. Um, and, and I was very mindful of the fact that when I was their age, I couldn't see any dancers of colour uh, in the Royal Ballet, whether they were or not, I, I, they weren't visible to me. Um, not long after that, I was commissioned to write a series of articles in the Dancing Times about the challenges of the dance sector faced. Um, and as part of that, um, I interviewed the directors of all the major ballet companies, including our next keynote speaker, Christopher Hansen. Um, ballet Black, that many of you will heard of, was a company started uh, at least two decades ago. Its mission has always been to one day become wonderfully unnecessary, but it was set out to address the lack of representation in the main ballet companies. Uh, that day still seems to be somewhere um, far over the rainbow. But our next speaker, as well as being director of Scottish Ballet, um, it was clear to me um, that, that his, his um, awakening happened long before, partly due to the fact that he as a board member of Ballet Black and that he had he has choreographed for the company on more, for more than one occasion. Um, and it was also very clear to me that he recognised his responsibility as director of a major UK ballet company and was determined to use his position of, of authority to help effect change. Um, although we can't hear your applause, um, I hope that you will give a very warm, <laughs> send through the ether, warm virtue energy to our next keynote speaker, the director of Scottish Ballet, Christopher Hampson. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you so much, Kenneth. And uh, thank you to um, all of the organisations coming together um, for this important discussion. Um, and particularly thank you to you, the delegates, um, for engaging and, and spending um, some time this morning uh, listening to us keynote speakers. Um, I want to speak today um, from a very particular perspective. Um, I'll just um, describe myself um, for those that, that may need it. Um, I'm a white male. I have um, silver gray hair, very short. I'm wearing a black t-shirt today and um, some glasses, thankfully, which I didn't wear yesterday, which didn't really help my dress rehearsal. I want to talk to you today, uh, really strictly speaking, from a ballet perspective and from leading a national arts organisation. I've described myself as a white male and I've described myself visually. I'm also a chief executive and artistic director. I have been a choreographer, a teacher, uh, a coach, and so I could also describe myself as a gatekeeper. If you drew a picture of what a gatekeeper looks like, it probably looks like this. Um, because ballet, uh, in my view, um, still does have some way to go in terms of access and opportunity for all people from diverse backgrounds and cultures. As Ken has said, my particular journey um, towards this has been through my very fruitful and um, I'm very grateful for my engagement as a board trustee of Ballet Black. And I have been spurred on through Ballet Black's work, particularly Casa Pancho in her leadership in addressing the problem of racism, systemic racism within ballet. And so I really want to frame where ballet is coming from in terms of our heritage. And then I'll also like to just talk about what we at Scottish Ballet are endeavouring to achieve 
in our, our commitment to driving anti-racism within ballet. And then finally, I'd just like to finish with some thoughts and some provocations around what we can do as gatekeepers, be you a teacher, running a school, a coach, a mentor, whatever it is, what, what you can do to enable access and to ensure that once that access is gained, that there is a safe space for people to flourish. In November 2019, there was an article in The Guardian which asked the question, does ballet have a race problem? Um, that headline really grabbed my attention because I just couldn't grasp how anyone was asking that there wasn't a race problem. The question in itself seemed just so out of whack to me. Um, because the short answer is yes. Because ballet is an art form, and art form reflects society, and there is systemic racism in society, therefore there is systemic racism within the art form. For me, that's a cycle which, you know, has lasted for centuries. Our heritage is from a royal hierarchical background, and we cannot ignore and we must accept that that is the very bedrock of classical ballet. And while we have journeyed away from that, we cannot ignore our foundations and we can't decide to move on without them. So the short answer to the Guardian's question, does, does ballet have a race problem is yes, but there's a far more nuanced answer as well. And the reason the answer is yes, is because there are still within the ballet world, instances of repertoire being perpetuated, which really has no place. I asked the question in the article, should ballet companies still be presenting the original version of Petrushka? You know, the answer is no, there's a black faced character in that production. And if you want to present it in an original way, it just is not appropriate. There's many ways you can, you can visualize that wonderful score. There's many ways you can tell that story. It then, begins to beg the question, what happens if ballet stops doing those productions? Well, I don't think anyone's proposing that we stop doing those productions in any form, but perpetuating that traditional um, representation of those productions, if that were to cease, there would be some really stunning things that happen. And Karina, our previous speaker, um, leaned into some of that you know, some fantastic things start to happen. We stop perpetuating unacceptable stereotyping. And often that's done in ballet through the guise of reverential um, treatment to our heritage. But actually all of those ballets were being created to reflect society. So in, in continuing to do that, we are still reflecting our heritage. And we start to fill the void with works that feel that they represent us today and that are import, important to our culture today. I think it's important to recognize our heritage. It's important to recognize what we bring to the table when we engage with ballet. And I think there's a great more we can be doing when we look at our repertoire and certainly from an artistic director's perspective. I think it's really important that in leading a company, I'm analyzing the repertoire and I'm analyzing the impact beyond the stage within our communities. To imagine there remains a place in a ballet company where it's acceptable pre to present blackface on stage or to deliver what I consider quite pyrotechnic dance competitions set in the background of slavery during the Ottoman Empire or th through some of the Chinese dynasties, I find it objectionable and it worries me that The Guardian has to write this article at all because ballet can be great. Ballet can be so much better than this. It can include a variety of viewpoints. It can include a real, uh, an inclusion of authentic experiences from diverse backgrounds. It's thanks to Ballet Black and the woefully few dancers and choreographers of color within the industry who call out I believe can be very stale and sluggish artistic planning. If we, if we let go of that, what it allows in is a future generation of dancers, of choreographers and leaders 
that will help us get on with creating uh, works of relevance, works of inclusion and works of integrity. I'd like to speak a little bit about what we've been doing at Scottish Ballet with, within that backdrop. Um, we have made a very visible um, uh, commitment to become an active ally to people and organizations who have demonstrated sustained commitment to anti-racism. But we do know that we have more to do. While we speak very openly within the company, we absolutely need to be leading and demonstrating and driving anti-racism throughout the industry. Classical ballet and access to elite training has included racism. It proliferates racial stereotypes and it does focus on and promotes the aesthetics of white dancers through pink shoes, costuming, hairstyles, as I've just discussed, the choices of stories that we tell. This is beginning to change, but there is so much more we can be doing. At Scottish Ballet, we took Ballet Black's Concise Guide, which is an excellent resource and I strongly recommend it. There's also a brilliant concise guide for dance schools too, and it's on their website, very easy to access. And what I noticed through engaging with that, with um, Scottish, leading Scottish Ballet, is the changes that are required, they are small, but they do make a big difference. We had committed some of these changes quite early on, but we've also through our journey discovered there's more we can be doing. We can be looking at our archives um, and we restore our archives at the National Libraries of Scotland and Scottish Theatre Archive. And um, while we've been looking through our archives, we want to make sure that this best represents our journey as an organisation and that while we can't change our past, we can accept our past and we can bring it to today and talk about our past. And we can change the future so that we're adding to our heritage, as Karina spoke. Auditions and recruitments are really important. Um, we don't feel we've been explicit enough um, to say that we are seeking black, brown and Asian dancers to join our company and our Young Associates programme. So we have made some changes to make sure that we're explicit in this and that we're explicit in our recruitment of staff as well. There's further engagement um, with our communities through our Safe To Be Me project, which looks at racism, it looks at ableism, it looks at colorism, it looks at a whole range of um, topics that can bring a sense of exclusion to young people, and it's aimed at those um, in primary six. We've also been looking at our press and marketing and alongside our repertoire and making sure that we begin to engage with dance writers and critics that have, that come to us with a greater diversity of experience and backgrounds. Our next steps are to make sure that we don't just talk about this and that action is everything. And that I think is where, um, as I speak to you as independent schools, as teachers, as agents of change, if you want to be that, um, there is something around Scottish Ballet now having, I would consider an open door. But this open door at the front of a company relies on there being a line of open doors to young people when they, when they, when ballet crosses their path, that there's an ability for young people to access ballet in all its forms. And once that access is gained, that there's support, safe space, and a pipeline that can be seen towards a ballet company. I think there's still a lot of work to do there. There are lots more actions need taking, but I am excited by a new generation of teachers and dancers that can enable this, that can open the door. You are all gatekeepers. And as gatekeepers, we do have a choice as to how we enable leadership, how we bring access and inclusion into ballet. And I just echo what Karina said, doing this will allow us to enrich our heritage, move the art form forward and become ever more relevant to our communities. Thank you so much for listening. I'm 
there's so much to say on this and 10 minutes really just isn't enough. Um, but I'm delighted to um, answer any questions, whether it's now or um, in the chat later. Thank you very much. I, I can hear that virtual applause um, going off, Chris. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to ask Stacey straight away. Stacey, you've just had listened to some of the things Chris said. Is there anything you'd like to pick up on? Um, yeah, thank you, Christopher. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, and I just, from my own personal experience, um, you know, I started um, taking ballet classes at the age of uh, four years old back in the late 70s. Um, I grew up in, in a city area that was very diverse and I entered a world um, that was very white. Um, I was one of a few children in that class. Um, and although I loved um, and I enjoyed my classes um, and I had an amazing teacher who was also white, I knew that I was different from the minute that I walked in. Um, and I knew that that really wasn't a space for me. I was pushed down towards the musical theater, what was then called funky jazz, uh, with all the isolations and fast jazz moves from the eighties. Um, I didn't think the classical world was for me or anyone that looked like me. I didn't see any representation. Um, and unfortunately, you know, in 2021, I think that is still apparent to a lot of people. And there's that perception that this is for white dancers. Um, it's a very white world with a certain body shape. Um, you know, I have didn't have a very um, high instep. Um, my physical attributes as my father is Jamaican, you know, I was made very aware of that, you know, and I think it's, you know, there's another conversation around the language, you know, like you said, we could talk about this for, for hours, um, but around, you know, the emotional harm that teachers can place on dancers, um, black or brown skin, about their feet, their body shape, and the way they hold themselves, trying to engage their pelvis when actually that's just their physical attributes. They can't do anything about that. Um, so, you know, I think trying to, you know, broaden access, particularly for classical dance, is a tall order, um, but a discussion that needs to be had. Thank you, Stacey. And um, just to say um, thank you to Ali G, who has put that, the, the, a link to the Ballet Black resource in the chat. Thank you, Ali. Um, and th there are a number of questions, Chris, but one particularly from Silke Arnold. She said, and thank you, Chris, for this insight. Could you share a little bit about your approach and observations around the audience journey and responses with regards to the change you have and are implementing on and around the stage? Yes, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, a Scottish ballet, um, certainly over the last 10 years, um, our repertoire, you know, we have a Christmas rep because we absolutely need to bring in some money to make sure that we're still functioning. But even our Christmas repertoire, we try and tell stories that are new and are of today. Um, so our repertoire is really built around stories that we feel we can tell. Um, I was just speaking with the dancers on Friday around a discussion that we're going to be having when we get back from the summer break around body image. And the one thing we get fed back from our audiences is that they enjoy seeing the array of body types that we have on stage. It allows us to tell richer stories. I'm thinking of the Crucible and the Streetcar Named Desire that we have. Great productions and that are really relevant today and, and, and can mirror some of the um, challenge that, challenges that society is facing today. Um, so our audiences, I believe, are accepting of us wishing to bring new stories and relevant stories. Um, but I think there is something um, to be, you know, further conversation to have around um, bringing audiences with you. And what do you do when you can't bring audiences or stakeholders or parents or um, children with you? I think, you know, we're at a time where we need to realize that moving forward sometimes means letting go of some things. And we need to be alive to that because it means that there's space for new things to come in. So I think that's a broader conversation, but I just put that out there as a provocation really. And thank you, Chris. Also, you look a really, some really look uh, challenging areas around repertoire, around heritage. Um, but also, um, you know, around access, around opportunity, um, but a real call to action. I like the phrase, um, action is everything and, and encouraging people to be agents of changes. And also this notion of a line of open doors. It's not just about opening one door, there are many. 
and, and something that I know that we may touch on later on um, is that notion of intersectionality. Because although this today's conversation is very much around race equality, um, you know, the fact is you can't, you know, it, not that we'll ever have ticked that box and say it's done, but you know, if you, you know, the young dancer of color that you may be teaching may also be uh, a woman, may also be gay or, uh, you know, in a, or, or defined in another way. Um, uh, they may, they could be, have a disability hidden or invisible. Uh, they could be from a low socioeconomic background. You know, they could be facing, mul facing multiple layers of disadvantage. And, and so I guess, look, you know, if my sense from all the discussions that I've had before this event with panelists and with, um, with speakers is, you know, if our ultimate aim is inclusivity, um, then, you know, race equality is just one <laughs> of the important challenges that we may be facing and how those things intersect with each other is, is part of the discussion. Um, there are almost too many questions um, coming up for me to field in the time, but I'm going to try and see if I can take one, one more. Um, um, this is from an anonymous attendee, and of course it's absolutely fine um, uh, to stay anonymous. Someone says, I'm committed to bringing black artists into predominantly white classrooms, but I worry the artists will feel they're being asked in a tokenistic way. How do I do this better? I don't know, Stacey or Christopher. <laughs> Uh, um, yeah, so um, this um, recently, um, the Tide movement were contacted um, by somebody asking this question. Um, and um, I understand, I mean, this person that asked us was a middle-aged uh, white woman who, um, choreographer who has been teaching for many years and didn't feel that it was her place to approach and who do I need in my team? Who do I need a network to try and have that conversation to attract or her intentions were great. Um, and it is a difficult um, conversation to have and to try and get the right approach. But if I personally feel, you know, I've struggled with that whole, um, it's tokenistic. I don't want to be that spokesperson, because particularly in this last year, everybody thinks that anybody of colour has the answers to all these questions and we don't. And I've spent the last year on a real personal journey and learned so much more than what I was taught um, from a very early age. And, you know, my answer to that was, well, if it's tokenistic for you, um, it's not tokenistic for me. And if I'm in that space um, and allowed to voice my opinions and share my experiences then you know without people of color in those spaces and without having um diverse boards and organizations and the people at the top of the pyramid of power um we're not going to make any of those changes um i do think um in terms of attracting a more diverse it's the way it's all in the wording and the language and the phrasing and speaking to other organizations about how they did that you know, if you, and also about visibility, if you're an organization that is visibly, um, that isn't diverse visibly, uh, whether that's internally or externally, um, how do you expect to attract a more diverse audience? That's not going to happen. So as Karina said, start with the self, look internally before you start to try and reach out rather than outreach that, I mean, that's another conversation I could speak about in terms of that saying, um, the outreach um, programs. But um, I think, you know, start with the self, look at what your organization is, look at the message that you are sending out um, and then start to do some work on that first before you start to promote trying to attract more diverse dancers into your organization. Thank you, Stacey. Chris, I can, I'm going to give you the last word on this. I see you've got your hand up before I introduce our next speaker. Thanks, Kenneth. I know you're really, really short on time. So I just want to add uh, something to what Stacey was saying around behaviour, because one of the challenges with ballet is it, it, the way it's taught is often quite servile. You know, it is a dancer student being told by a teacher. And I think those behaviours need to evolve and change. I think they are doing with a new generation of teachers, which is great. But that conversation also enables, I think, better transparency and authenticity. That's brilliant, Chris. And I and I, I think, please um, don't let me forget. I want to come back when we when we bring all the panelists together because I I certainly want to pick your brains about any further suggestions or encouragement you might have for the teachers at how to approach opening those doors at the level of a local ballet school. 
Um, and just to say, Chris, I know from our conversation that we had for the Dancing Times that, that one of the things that you got full support from your board um, because it's hard to make the kind of changes that you're talking about, those big structural changes, unless you have support up and down the organization. Um, so well done for getting that, for being so passionate and persuasive um, and for really starting to move things. Um, and thank you very much for being with us this morning. Um, uh, that's the cue. I wish I wish we could hear applause on Zoom, do, don't you? Um, but I'm sure it's there. Thank you so much, Chris. <laughs> um, so um, my next speaker, um, I've had the privilege of knowing her in many guises, first as a dancer, a formidable dancer uh, uh, with Phoenix Dance Theatre. Uh, I was lucky enough to have her as a trustee when I was chief executive at the place. Uh, she's a woman of enormous passion and conviction. Um, and and whether as former artistic director of Phoenix Dance Theatre or in her current role as CEO and principal of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance and as a deputy lieutenant of Leeds, she's also someone who's determined to use her position of privilege and power to make a difference. Uh, she has a charming smile and a sense of humour, but is absolutely unafraid when it comes into entering unchallenging territory. Um, please, a very warm welcome to Sharon Watson speaking to us from Leeds. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, Kenneth, for that introduction. Um, I should write that down and use that because actually right now, I hope that my formidability kind of takes me through this in this uncomfortable space, um, which is what I've titled my, my presentation to you this morning. But first, I'd just like to extend my thanks for the invitation to take this space through the conversation and the dialogue. I'm Sharon Watson. I'm the CEO and the principal of the Northern School of Contemporary Dance. And I'm here for those of you who would benefit from the description. Um, I'm a black female. I have very dark black hair, tied it back in a ponytail. I wear glasses when I'm reading and I'm on the computer. At this moment in time, my glasses, I think I have about 30 odd because I keep losing them. And the one I currently have is tinted with purple and I'm wearing a white shirt, which is buttoned at the neck. So yes, this, this, is, um, this is a welcome conversation. And I also welcome the opportunity to be able to speak openly honestly and without judgment. And I start by inviting you, our audience, into this uncomfortable space, which I have experienced for many years and which I also understand many black people have lived here for the whole of their experience. So this is a, I, I call it the uncomfortable space, but I hope it's a safe space for which information can be shared because it's a place and a time where we have to trust that we these conversations can be had in the open. I speak from a lived experience and I preference that with my presentation. This is not everybody's experience. So please bear that in mind as you listen to what I have to share with you. We've heard from Karina and Chris about language and how impactful and often impactful that can be to any individual or group of people. We've heard about our pipeline challenges and I would say, although Chris has demonstrated that those, and that those examples are from the ballet world, it also applies to the other dance forms, and which I have also experienced here in the UK as a performer. And often people assume because you're of the perceived top end of the hierarchy, that you're exempt from the challenges, which couldn't be further from the truth. So along throughout my career, I, um, in every form, in every direction I've taken, it hasn't gone away. It's been with me, which is probably what makes me so formidable in terms of the conviction I have to be able to talk about it. I will also pose a few questions whilst I'm along the way, because I think sometimes there are more questions than there are answers right now. And just to have the questions out there is a very useful thing to, to put into your toolkit and maybe an opportunity to discuss them at a later date might arise. But we have systems which perpetuate the status quo. And I think you heard that also in the earlier presentations. However, the power of 2020 has been our visibility. And somehow there is strength and there's optimism within this moment in time. It's this conversation, this discussion is the fear of, of discussing racism. And it's something, unfortunately, many of us live with every day and very often in a space that isn't visible. I would be surprised if I ever walked into a room 
and it'd be full of white people by myself or maybe one or two others and someone would call it out somehow that this isn't right it unfortunately doesn't happen and it happens the fact that actually you can be at very at cultural organizations which i'm sure many of us attend and when you do call it out it's a problem it's seen as being disruptive it's seen as being uh it's deflected and the majority in that room feel uncomfortable when it's raised it's not a good thing in my role and i'm going to list a number of them um, not all of them are listed but ones which i imagine will resonate with the majority of our audience as a dancer a performer rehearsal director education director board member interview panelist choreographer i'm adding gatekeeper uh, as an artistic director, a CEO and principal, just to name a few, you're always, I have always experienced navigating this uncomfortable space, which I try addressing. Sometimes it's not the abort, abort racism, it's the microaggressions and the red tape, which is designed to keep things as they are. There is a fear that by taking a stance and by talking about racism, that attitudes to one individual and the um, opportunities for changes one becomes ostracized from conversations or sometimes from opportunities. I need to add, this is a real space. Something which, in my opinion, should not exist at all. However, it does exist, but it takes years to bring to the fore, has major consequences, not because it's wrong to address, but the denial of truth is dehumanizing and exhausting. And silence is complicit. The microaggressions we heard earlier, um, and actually just to elaborate a little, the, the saying, I don't see color. Some people think that's a good thing, right? Wrong. By not seeing color, you don't see me. You don't identify with the importance of addressing the lack of diversity in your space, therefore your actions. I become invisible. You cannot have integrity in the actions you take when you say you wish to address equity, inequality and inclusion. The conversations I'm currently having with my staff and I've been in post for just over a year is that I hope will sustain and make sustainable changes within this organization for now, for the organization that I now run as a CEO and principal. And as the head of the school, it's important that I'm not here to put a plaster on it because of the color of my skin. I could parachute in and make those decisions and that would be absolutely the wrong thing to do. But what I don't understand underneath those plasters, the healing and the conversations have not yet taken place. And I believe that that's where we're at at the moment. As Christopher explained with Scottish Ballet, those conversations and discussions around what needs to change is a real place for us right now. We refrained from putting statements out on our website. The knee-jerk responses to the Black Lives Matter was not something I felt was necessary whilst we went through and I understood what the situation was, where we are and what our future will look like. I have, however, forewarned my staff of the onset of lethargy and that this cannot derail us with the changes we want to see and the organisation we want to become. As a black person, we are called upon to have these hard conversations. And I have to agree with Stacey, somehow the black people need to be in the room. Unfortunately, history tells us that the conversations without us there cannot be trusted to make change. Therefore, we have to be a part of the discussion to help the thinking, to help the narrative and to implement the actions. And without respect to finding black people in our spaces, we continue to perpetuate the systemic systems that are there to do what they always do. And they're doing them incredibly well. For many, many years now, we are trying to break the systems. And unfortunately, the penetration is very, very small. With listening to this webinar, we have this opportunity and we have the power to impact change. And yes, all your gestures, however small you deem them to be, are important. And it becomes even more essential that you do not neglect the very small things that add up to the very big things. And for us, for me, as a black woman, every support, every form of allyship becomes an asset and strengthens the argument and the debate 
and also we are working on a spectrum. We are working within communities, we are working within our education systems, we are working with our politicians, we are working with our dance educators, and every possible aspect of these needs penetrated in different ways. There isn't one person that can do all. So your help is needed, your ambitions and your actions are required. About half of the population knows what they're doing when they come to excluding others. Equally disturbing is the huge number of people we deny, who deny racism, but will engage in microaggressions. But everyone has the right to be seen and treated fairly. And when people don't deliberately intend to offend this, this, in this operation of unconscious bias, but too often bias is conscious. The psychological effects of these, of these, hard, these hard and soft forms of aggression, stroke, racism, are immense. They reduce people's confidence. We sometimes ask why X isn't, isn't um, making progress or they're not engaging, but we're always in the back of the room perhaps. Well, these forms of biases make it harder for individuals to achieve their goals. For society as a whole, the psychological demoralization of a whole group of people means that when populations, when the population suffers, that the whole population suffers because it reduces the incentive for talented people to make their full contribution. You don't have to be a revolutionary to combat racism. I would suggest, however, the work we can do collectively is an action which requires you to do something. To do nothing, I will say, is an action. To make mistakes will be part of the process. We heard that at the beginning of this discussion. But as we work towards what is deemed appropriate or acceptable or equal, we have to put ourselves in the position and we have to be ready for change. We're not always going to get it right, trust me on that. But to not attempt to go there is as big a problem. I'll end it there, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Sharon. And um, I, I think that, that the, the point you made at the very end, it strikes me that you know, as dance teachers, I think we more than anyone um, probably understand the concept that, that, you know, well, failure perhaps is the wrong word, but you know, the, the route to success is made up of many failures. You try to stand on one leg, you don't quite make it, you readjust, you try again. We're used to that as dancers. Mm -hmm. um, but, so it strikes me from one of the things I've taken from what you said, it strikes me as the worst thing that we could do is out of fear is not do anything. You know, fear that we might get something wrong. And, and, and you know, getting things wrong is not just the prerogative of any, you know, of any person. I mean, uh, we're all on a learning journey. You know, you know, I have learned things from colleagues who have a very different lived experience to me. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to add my own brief comment to the, to the thing you raised about I don't see colour, which is, I know that when I've heard that it, phrase used, the sense in which, I, well, when I've heard it, I've sensed that it has been meant with the best of intentions, i.e. to say, um, I, you know, I'm not going to treat you any differently or with any less respect or any less compassion because of your color. So it's meant to somehow neutralize, you know, that that, that, that difference is not being used as a weapon. However, I also do understand, and one of, part of my learning was listening to colleagues who found that statement very uncomfortable uh, because, you know, first of all, I mean, one, one lighthearted response, well, can, you know, do you need your eyes testing? Can't you see that there is actually a different pigmentation going on here? But the more fundamental and important and serious thing underlying that was the fact that you know, they say that with this, this is not just about my skin culture, it's about my heritage, it's about my sense of identity. Karina talked about identity in her keynote. It's about everything that gives me my sense of who I am, my culture, my being. And so by sort of trying to pretend that we are exactly the same or that you don't see that part of me, as you said, it can make you feel, it can make someone feel invisible, which often is not the intent. So I think that, you know, these, there are lessons for us all to learn by opening up these conversations and, and, in, and heading to, uh, sticky water. Um, I also heard very clearly your comment about not, uh, you know, the pressure that we were all under in this last year and your refusal to sort of um, make a knee-jerk response. And certainly I know, I know Christopher, if he doesn't mind me speaking brief for him, had the same, was under the similar pressure at Scottish Ballet to put out a public statement and he resisted that wholeheartedly because he said, you know, we've got to be able to talk to ourselves, you know, as a company about this before we can, you know, push statements out to the public. So it, it's what one thing it strikes me is that 
you know, a lot of the work that needs to happen on will take place outside the public view. It will happen, you know, in the studio or in the classrooms or in institutions where we learn, you know, we open up these difficult discussions with ourselves because, you know, performative quick fix, you know, stuff that you can put, you know, anyone can put, put a post up or a black square, but that doesn't, we know that that is not going to address some of the issues. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I'll hand it over, ask Stacey if she's got any comments is one of the very positive things that uh, came out of, um, I know that uh, I think almost all the large ballet companies started, you know, equality, diversity and inclusion groups. Um, one of the things that came out of discussions of the Royal Ballet Dancers, and this was referred to, touched on earlier on, things to do with hair, costume, makeup are, uh, have been challenging for years, you know, finally we get, you know, uh, f flesh coloured tights for dancers of colour and shoes. Um, but uh, at the Royal Ballet, they've recently undertaken um, a consultation with every single dancer in the company um, around um, hair, costume, makeup, and how they want to feel when they go on stage. And I know that in the, in the sense of the wider world, that might not seem earth shattering. But I think in the context of, you know, a company like the Royal Ballet, I think that is allowing space for the individual voice to be heard. And I think I'd like to think that over time that creates a profound culture change within an institution where it's not just about hair and makeup, it is about the individual. I can see that you want to come back later, Sharon. I just would like to add one thing to all of what we've just been listening to. And I think sometimes to have the courage to bring this conversation or to even raise it is a bigger issue than, than most things. And I think, you know, something so simple as just having what is considered a flesh colored leotard to, to support the artist in their ability to do their job well is a, is a challenge. So courage is something that I, you know, there are many ways in which we can build courage and to be able to ask the questions around how that happens, I think is also a discussion because, you know, my staff don't know me, but I encourage them to address me as a black female and not to see that black is negative. That, you know, the positives that I bring to the table can be adorned by the color of who I am and who I am as a female. So it's flipping the lens from which we see things and how we start the conversations. And that sometimes takes time if someone has never really had to address another person by understanding that their color is important, then you, you have to have that conversation to bring them to the table. Yeah. Stacey, let me let me bring you in, see if you've got any any comments. Well, there's there's so many things that I could feed into there. Thank you, Sharon, um, with what you've said. And I just wanted to say that, you know, the position that Sharon holds and, you know, with all of her experience, you know, I've always been inspired by your work. And for every dancer, black or brown skin dancer, it is about that representation at the top. You know, you need somebody to aspire to. So, you know, it, it's always, you know, when I wanted to, when I went into dancing, I always wanted to be a teacher. I always wanted to work with children and young people. Um, but when I went for my training, you know, I, that I found myself in another, you know, it was another white area. I didn't see anybody um, of color or anyone that looked like me when I was doing my teacher training. So I think, you know, for young dancers to, to aspire to be in those places, we have to see that representation. And I just want to pick up as well about what we were saying about, you know, the fact that you didn't put that statement out, you know, so many colleges did and they got it wrong. Um, and, you know, the, the, what happened on social media had a real effect and impact on my mental health and well-being, as it did a lot of people um, of colour um, in terms of having all the answers, you know, seeing that division, being shocked by people, um, colleagues, peers, people that you've known for years coming out with statements that were highly offensive and then not even realising what they were saying because, oh, well, it, we, we didn't mean it about you because we know you and we don't see that, you know, we don't see you as black, you know, <laughs> you know, it, it's laughable really, but it, you know, it's not funny. It is offensive. Um, and I think we can have all the conversations. We can, you know, keep having these conversations and that's where it needs to start, but it's about the doing. And my concern is where are we going to be at next year? I feel like, you know, the doors open for people to have these conversations, but how long is that door going to be opened? You know, who are the people in power that are going to make these changes? Because it, it's not the people at, at, at grassroots level, it's the people at the top and we need to be in those spaces to make those changes happen. 
Thank you, Stacey. Um, I'm, I'm going to feed one question in that's coming from the chat. Uh, this, is, this is quite a little while ago from Dr. Katerina Ferugia Creel. Um, Dr. Katerina, please forgive oh. me if I haven't pronounced your name correctly. Um, she, she is the co-editor co of the New Oxford Handbook of Contemporary Ballet, launched earlier this month in the UK. And she talks with the care and the, and the very conscious choice they made about ch choosing an image um, for the front cover. Um, you know, uh, I think I think if I'm reading, sorry, it's it, uh, at speed. Um, I, I think of a uh, you know of a black dancer, but something that might you know not the usual suspects, so to speak. But she has a very specific question, um, which I'll I'll float now, but we may not be able to answer it fully now. She said her question is, how will the dance teaching organisations in the UK and through their global reach continue to embrace diversity as we move towards? Um, as we move forwards from policy to action. Um, you can either choose to answer that now or you can put it in your, in your thinking cap and we'll come back to it during the, the, group, the group session. Um, uh, Sh Sharon, Sharon, something else you said very clearly um, was um, you, you, just the idea, in, again, in your call to action is that you don't have to be revolutionary, that it, it can be about the small things. Um, is there a tension between the small things seeming tokenistic <laughs> and actually when you're going to sort out the real problems or you know how, how, how what would you say to reassure people <laughs> that those small things you know can make a difference and won't necessarily be perceived as, as tokenism the thing is i don't we can't fix anything if we don't start the journey now someone who has a school in a rural village who very rarely will see people of color cannot suddenly produce students and dancers and parents of color to be in their space so what's the alternative to making sure that actually you're giving them a broader experience? How do you invite people into your space specifically to address the fact that actually you could have a dance class by a different cultural organization that enables you to experience something different, something new. You're not, they're not gonna magically be born in that community. So let's open the doors and bring that in based on the fact that we have different cultures that can meet in the middle for an experience that actually can enhance both parts, both parties that are engaging. And I think the small gestures, and we talk about images, and you know, you can look at any website, you can look at, and if actually if you look at the percentage, just flip it, flip it on its head. So turn that image into a black and white image and tell me what you see. If you see the majority white, then you know that's not right. And the same can be done of the other on the reverse. If it's majority black, when you're talking about equality and you're trying to put a balance amongst things, then just see how that feels for other people. So you can really make very small changes. And when you do that, perhaps you could discuss it with someone of color to say, actually, am I approaching this in the right way? If I have five dancers in my, and I have a picture that has, that has got a mixture of dancers, is this picture A, of quality, and does it represent? And B, is it the right way to say that we're looking at and addressing, not just the tokenistic of putting black people in there. They've still got to look good. They've still got to have all the qualities. They've still got to be representative in the way that in the forms that they're delivering but just have that conversation because it might be that you've actually got it completely on its head. And on the other side of it, it might be absolutely fantastic. So off you go. You know, that, when you say that Sharon, it reminds me of the world of advertising where we've seen some wonderful clangers, haven't we? And you, and, and, and you come away going, who was in, it, not so much who was in the room, who was not in the room? How yeah. did that ever get signed off? Uh, anyone who's got the appetite after this uh, has finished. Um, if you if you Google, I think the Heineken light advert <laughs> that, that caused a huge controversy that got pulled, where where a barman slides a beer bottle down a long bar, and and it passes various people of color, a, a black woman, a man, a black man playing the guitar, and arrives at a lighter skinned woman at the other end of the bar, who as she picks up the bottle, the tagline goes, "Sometimes things are better light." Now, whatever the intention was with that, I, when I saw I sat open mouth and I thought, all I could think of was who wasn't in the room, just to do that sense check, just to go, we may not mean that, but you, you know, th this is not going to go down well with some people. Um, uh, I'm very mindful of the time. It's, a, it's almost time to bring, bring the other panellists um, back. Um, Sharon, you also spoke, um, uh, one thing, I, uh, the final comment I think I want to pick up, and when, when you were talking about, uh, you know, uh, Something you said made me think about the fact that it was only, a, and having started dance at the age of five, it was only when I was, I think, 20 um, that I was taught, I think, for the whole of my third year at the place by a black male teacher. And I don't think I'd ever consciously thought about it. I just had, you know, I had good teachers and teachers that I respected and teachers I loved and teachers that pushed me and teachers that gave me so much. That was the important thing. 
but I realized for the first time, and I, I don't even know if I ever articulated it in words to myself, but the feeling of just having a set of eyes on you, who I immediately felt a, a sense of acceptance by, because, you know, perhaps, you know, I, you know, I, there was a sense of familiarity or recognition or, you know, um, I, I know whatever you think of my dancing, you're not going to reject me because I don't look like you know, the, the, the majority of the people in the classroom. How important that can be, um, just that sense of having different sets of eyes on you. Um, I, I think we have reached the moment when it's time to bring the other panelists back um, and we can begin to open up to some of the many questions. So I'm welcome back uh, to join Stacey and Sharon. I'm welcome back Christopher Hampson and I'm welcome back Karina um, H. Maynard. Um, let me throw um, this one out. Look, you've all been listening to each other and there's been some earnest debate and then you've probably, I hope, been looking, there have been lots of comments in the chat. And by the way, can I just encourage, um, there, there are a lot of comments that have been put in the Q&A, um, but they're not questions. <laughs> there's some wonderful stuff in there, but they're not questions. And it will probably make it a bit harder for the people trying to field the questions if you, um, if you put just long comments in, in the question and it's not clear who the director that. So can I encourage attendees, please use the Q&A for questions and please be clear who you're directing them at. And then please put all other longer generous and there's some lovely comments and some thoughtful comments, please put them in the chat so they, other people can read them. Um, do any of you want to pick up on anything that someone else has said that has struck you as particularly important or maybe for you has been a revelation or, or a new thought or a new idea or has given you a new spur? <laughs> um, Chris? Uh, I'm, I'm happy to kick off. Um, yes, I've absolutely um, really enjoyed listening to Karina and to Sharon. I think, uh, you know, what, what you both said is quite pertinent and should be underlined is this idea of, um, you know, non-engagement and, you know, sitting on the side of the road watching it go by is an action and you need to think about that. And I think that's, that's really important, really speaking from someone who identifies as Caucasian, it's really easy to do that. I can tell you, it's really easy. And I often think the watchword for me is if, if I'm feeling uncomfortable, if I'm feeling nervous or defensive, I'm normally in the right space. And I think recognizing it and leaning into it, walking towards it's really important. Um, but I, you know, to hear it from Sharon and Karina, I think it's really impactful. Yeah, I agree, um, Christopher, you know, it is the small things because that's where it starts. Um, and to to not um, take that first step um, is is really detrimental to the industry that we all work in and to the next generation of performers, choreographers, teachers, um, producers, theatre owners, if only. Um, and I think it's really important for that to happen. You know, social media has played a massive part in all of this over the last year um, and has, has affected so many, particularly the, you know, young performers today um, and the teachers. And I think it, it can't just be a stick in plaster exercise. It can't just be, yes, I follow that page. Yes, you know, um, I'm, you know, going to put my black screen on, um, post another quote from somebody else's page and then not do anything. You know, the reason why I set the tired movement up was because I wanted to work with everybody in the industry and we work as a collective and we're all singing from the same song sheet. You know, it can't just be one organization making these changes. The changes are too big, you know, and, I, and I, we have to work together. Um, and, you know, that starts with education and, and just talking to somebody, asking those questions. You know, it, we've all got to be, as educators, invested in improving equity, inclusivity and representation in this industry for those changes to be made. Um. I'm going to pick up on one question um, that's in the, come up in the chat, which is, uh, again, what are the key points of advice for dance principals within the, with the, aver within the average dance school? 
um, not entirely sure what the average dance school is, but you know, let's say a local ballet school, um, as opposed to a conservatoire, uh, to implement change. What, what's the key points of advice? Uh, where do we start? I would also love some advice. Love some advice on what language we use on our marketing and website to acknowledge that we're that we're inclusive. Um, okay. I'm going. Uh, Stacey, you may well have an answer, but I also want the other panelists. Okay. To, yeah, that's if, right. Uh, to follow on, if you've got any particular advice, but Stacey, you've got the floor now. Um, yes, just to say, I'm going to use this opportunity. As of September, we will be launching the conversation tour where we hope to reach as many dance schools in this country to work with students, to work with teachers um, about what it means to be inclusive and to look at almost like an audit of your organization. And Sharon mentioned just, just the first instance of putting a poster up that is inclusive and diverse, you know, not just having typical pink tight ballet dancers with certain body types that that's all that they see when they walk in to that classroom or to that studio setting, making sure that your dolls in your baby class are diverse. You know, they're simple things. It's not that difficult. So to not even make those small changes is, you know, you're part of the problem as far as I'm concerned. And that is something really easy to do. So, you know, I would like for everybody that's involved, you know, that sat here listening today to these amazing talks that, you know, we've had from Christopher, Karina and Sharon, you know, find out more about the workshops and the work that the tired movement are doing, because, you know, this is for everybody in the dance community and those small changes mean will mean so much to every black and brown dancer that walks into a dance school. Any other panelists want to come up, pick up on this point? Any advice that you might have? Where do you start? <laughs> I, would, I would add to that. The first thing is really accepting that difference is it can be positive and not to fear because I think the moment you start to do, make these small changes, you are going to notice that things are gonna look different. And for, your, for the people that you work with, I mean, unfortunately the statements that I hear people saying is, oh, it's all turning black now because you've brought in another person, you've brought in two people, or you've decided to do a program that's got a black focus. It, and those kind of comments, those are the microaggression of comments. So it's understanding when they have been said, having the courage to talk about them, to stop them in their tracks and enable them. Yes, it's going to be very visible because we've got such a long way to catch up. There is a massive deficit, so it will look different. And if it doesn't, then perhaps you're not working hard enough. Um, I would also say that the different angles I mentioned earlier about the, the injection of, of interaction is important. If you have strength within your MPs and your politicians, because they're writing us out of the systems, you need to be able to hold on to those that can support you. If indeed it is you know, good principles within your teaching, allow your teachers to broaden that and understand how that fits, not just within the classical technique or the contemporary, but maybe it's in with the South Asian or maybe it's in with the, with the African cultural dance forms, whatever it is, good principles in teaching are good principles. And you can find that throughout many, many different forms, dance styles. So you can't, you know, the hierarchy of who does what, when should no longer be a conversation. So there's just many ways in which you can tap in. And I think it's a whole 360 approach, not just necessarily one studio activity. Karina, yes, go ahead. Yeah, can I just say, I mean, it's incredibly inspiring for me um, hearing Sharon and Christopher speak, especially because I think leadership is so important. The attitudes of leaders, the openness of leaders. And, you know, um, we've heard today from very progressive leaders but who've also spoken about the fact that they bring in other um, cultural influences or they use resources by other organizations and I think that really highlights the fact that a collaborative approach is needed so whether you're a small local dance school or you're a conservatoire um, be open to receiving the help and the support from you know experts in different areas as and when it's needed I think most of the problems that arose with larger institutions last year who spoke up too soon about Black Lives Matter without doing the work internally was that when um, people directed um, criticism towards them their defenses were really strong and sometimes it's good to sort of again reflect do some work get the help that you need know that you don't have all the answers 
um, and people can be incredibly understanding when they see that you're trying to get on the path or on the path to doing the right thing. We, um, we are heading fast for a break. Um, so I need to think about wrapping this section up. It has gone so quickly. And I want to say, I know for the people who, there are so many questions in that, in that Q&A that we haven't got to. Um, well, I'll have a chat with my colleagues over the break about what we try and do to address some of those, um, because I suspect there'll be many that we don't get time to talk about. Um, as we prepare to say goodbye to our panelists, um, I just would like you to do, perhaps just uh, give me one brief sentence, one thing that either that you will take away and think about or do differently as a result of today, or one or one thing that you would encourage others to think about or do differently from today's discussion. Um, let me start. Um, who would like to go first? Christopher. <laughs> I'll go first. There's so many takeaways. Um, but I guess, you know, um, I, I think we're talking to delegates who are here today that want to make a difference, I'm, I'm presuming. And so I guess I, I would say, you know, as kind of said, the, this isn't something we solve. This is something we drive and live with and improve upon and commit to. And just be wary within our, in, and, and taking it back to the industry, you know, this isn't a competition. Where you see it done well, point to it and applaud it and give it a, give it a spotlight and learn from it and, and pass it on. You know, let, let's share and, um, you know, make sure that, that, that it becomes sector-wide. I think that's really important. Thank you, Chris. Sharon. Thank you. Uh, amazing takeaways. Um, but a, a couple of things just to say that it's, it is everybody's responsibility from those that consider themselves at the very early stages, um, challenging those that sit at the top, that write the policies, that bring the questions to light. So it's not just a black person's job to fight for black people. Um, it's not just the Asian person's job to fight for Asians, it's all our job. So really do see yourself and understand how you can be an ally, because I think if you understand that, if you're not, um, if you're not a, a black person, Asian person, ethnic minority, then that helps you to step into that space a little closer so you can ask the questions. Understand how that starts. Um, Stacey, I'm going to come to you later because we, we're not saying goodbye to you. <laughs> um, just uh, uh, on time. Um, Karina. Yeah, I think for me, it's um, my takeaway is that there are so many more resources. There's always so much more research to do. Um, so I think, you know, I've taken note of many things that Sharon and Christopher have said, and I'll continue to listen throughout the day, um, because that's, that's what empowers us. Um, the more that we know, the more experiences that we're exposed to, then the more we can develop. So that's what I'll continue to do. I'm, I'm going to share, thank you so much. I'm going to share one quick comment from Casa Pancha, Casa Pancha at Ballet Black, the director of Ballet Black, who said, all dance organizations, schools and companies need to treat anti-racism work in the same way they treat injury prevention and care. It's never ending, everyone's responsibility and completely embedded into the ethos of the company and school. Um, there are more comments to, to see in the chat. Thank you for that, Casa, and welcome. Glad you're here. Um, and, and Chris, I think that was a wonderfully positive reminder, the fact that, you know, we can talk about these things as a problem and as a challenge, but there is also an opportunity and there is something really, you know, really positive um, in all of this. Um, so thank you so much to our panelists. Um, it's been wonderful. Thank you for giving up your, I know how busy each of you are. So thank you for giving your thought, your time, your careful preparation, and just being here in the moment with everyone. I'm sure there's a huge round of applause. Um, and when I mentioned applause before, people were putting in chat, yes, we're applauding. I'm sure they are. Um, as we go into the break, um, we will have a 10 minute break. Um, but just as we go into the break, I'm gonna we're going to share with you a short film um, it's, it's part of a series of um, bite, BBC bite sized films um, featuring John Amechi, who is a former basketball player and now an, an organizational psychologist. Um, I think he talks with great sense and with great reason. <laughs> um, and, and this is a very short film on the difference between, between, non, between being non racist and anti racist. Um, so um, we will come back into the room at, I think, uh, 11 50 or just after do you have a comfort break and a tea break but please enjoy the film thank you to our panelists 
There's a big difference between being not racist and being anti-racist. I know it doesn't seem like it. I know that both of these things seem equally good, but they're not. Think of an interaction. Uh, I'm afraid you've probably had one, right? With, with somebody, maybe even somebody you respect, maybe even someone you love, who says something that's racist, does something that's racist, behaves in a way that's racist. Someone who's not racist, they won't say or do anything in that moment. They want to not rock the boat. They don't want to be upstanding. Instead, not racist, they tend to be bystanders. But afterwards, after the event, they'll find other people who are also not racist, and they'll talk to each other about, oh, that was terrible, that thing that happened the other day. I would never say anything like that. Anti-racists are different, and they come in all shapes and sizes. They come in all ages. Anti-racists are constantly looking around to say, what tools do I have available to make it clear that this is not acceptable? And this, this is what anti-racists do. It's not that they stand up at the dinner table when their uncle's a little bit racist and kick the turkey off. That's not it. But what they do do is they say, I'm sorry, Uncle John, that's not acceptable. That's racist. Quietly and respectfully. What they do is make sure that they never miss an opportunity to let the world know where they stand, even if they can't change everything. You're probably in a position where other people have a lot more power around you. I know how that feels. Sometimes we sit and we look around us and we think, how can I possibly change all this? And sometimes you can't. But what you can do is make sure wherever you go, people know where you stand. They know that you're an anti-racist. You become a beacon of light that way. You become someone who makes other people want to be anti-racist too. You've got tools at your disposal. Learn, read, and make everybody clear where you stand.